Okay, so we need to have a, another discussion about some of the wild things that have been in the news lately. And tonight's subject is something that's very, 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 very expensive and complicated. And um, it has to do with some of the smallest things that people deal with in their daily lives. And that is this chip shortage. The chip apocalypse. The uh, chip catastrophe. Whatever you want to call it. That's been going on for the past two years. And uh, semiconductor industry. So, chips, computer chips, as we usually call them, refer to semiconductor devices, okay? And um, I happen to know a little bit about this industry and what a chip is and how it's made. So I have somewhat of an authority to talk about this stuff, even though I'm not an EE or, and I don't design semiconductors and, or really, I'm just kind of around them on a regular basis and the people and the places that make them. So, <clears throat> what, ha what was in the news today? Intel. You know, uh, Intel, that big uh, blue company uh, logo out there that's on every computer case in the, in the world almost. So, Intel announced that it's building a huge, plans to build at this enormous, massively expensive, complex manufacturing plant in the great state of Ohio, right next door here in Ohio. Interesting, right? Ohio. Does Ohio have any other semiconductor companies with plants in the, in it? I thought about that for a minute, and I couldn't think of any offhand. I found out that the company First Solar has a plant there. First Solar isn't really the same as computer chips, but they are semiconductor devices, so that's somewhat related, but not really. It's a little bit, it's, it's, it's a different business. Um, so Intel wants to build big plants in Ohio. They're looking to spend a hundred billion dollars. hundred billion dollars. Let me take a sip of this and think about that for a second. hundred billion dollars um, a tenth of a trillion dollars on a factory in Ohio okay I think it was maybe a year ago something like a year ago 2021 sometime Intel also announced that it was building 20 billion dollar factories in Arizona and Arizona, I kind of blew that off because Arizona has a pretty well-established semiconductor um, uh, ecosystem, as they call it, um, in, that, in that state for, for these manufacturing plant support services. So <clears throat> I think, you know, when this whole chip shortage began, the federal government, you know, starting from our president, got all worked up over this idea that, oh my God, you know, they looked at it and they realized that over the past 40 years, the semiconductor industry has been pushing manufacturing away from the United States. And this obviously is an industry that started in the United States and also was a, it had a little bit of a, a, a footing in Europe too for a while, but Europe is, was sort of the second rate location for semiconductors. But the U.S. Uh, at one time had, I think it was 90, early 90s or something like this, 37% of the what they call the manufacturing capacity of semiconductor products in the world. And they say that that number has dropped to 12%. Um, with the majority of that m movement going to Asia. And of course, it's a percentage. It's not an absolute number. So even though we might still be making a lot of semiconductors in the U.S., the fraction of the worlds that are being made are said to have dropped from 37 to 12 percent. 
mostly going to Asia. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and now also in China. There's a lot of upcoming uh, production in the past decade or so that's been started there. So our politicians in Washington, of course, in various, all their political parties and, and theories and uh, concepts of how industry and government should function have seen this as a problem. So, I have a little bit of a problem with that myself, but not in the same way that they do. So, the problem is that the industry, the semiconductor industry, has over the past 40 years been moving its business to Asia. Okay, that's been happening in stages. Back in probably the 1980s, they started moving all of what they call the assembly and test to countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, China to some degree, um, because of labor costs. Because when you have when you make semiconductors, there's there's a there's at least three different processing steps, major processing centers that exist. So you make these things called wafers. This is a wafer that's partially completed and has defects. That's the reason that I have it. So this wafer is made from silicon. The silicon has to be converted from its natural form, and usually in the form of some kind of quartz-bearing mineral, into the wafer itself. That usually happens in some set of locations. You know, there's various, lo various plants around the world that do that. Even here in the United States, we have plants in Texas that I'm aware of, and in Arizona, and I think even in Washington, where wafers are manufactured. And the wafer is produced using a crystal growing process. I'm not going to get too technical because it's a, I don't want to be sitting here for two hours talking about it. But they grow the crystal and they slice it like a loaf of bread and they create these wafers. And they sell these wafers worth nothing on the surface. They sell them to what's called a fab, F-A-B, fabrication facility. And the fab's job is producing the pattern that's on the wafer. Okay, and that pattern is comprised of the actual thing that you're manufacturing, whether it's a single unit device like a diode or a transistor, or it's in a complicated processor with a billions of transistors on it. All of that happens converting that bare surface substrate. The wafer is nothing more than a substrate. Converting that into a substrate that contains a surface with a few micron layer, layers thick of what is your active devices, diodes, transistors, integrated circuits, or whatever, memory chips, processors, um, whatever, it, whatever it is. And then the fab has this finished wafer, okay, that looks like, you know, that looks kind of like these, actually, you know, it looks exactly like these. There's one that's was at the end of the processing line and it got rejected and um, you know for whatever reason so they have these wafers and then this wafer gets packaged up with a bunch of other ones put in a box put on an airplane and it gets sent over to Asia gets sent to the Philippines gets sent to Malaysia gets sent to China gets sent to Vietnam where they take a saw or a laser and they cut these lines and they cut them into individual pieces called dye and then the dye gets stuck into a package that looks uh you know could look like a lot of things sometimes they look like that that's a big package called a to 247 package i have all kinds of crap here you know as you can see there's a, a to220 package Oh, here's a TO-92 package. And they get put into all these things. Sometimes they get made into what's called an integrated circuit. That's your actual like processor or a, a logic chip or a memory chip. And then, uh, and then it gets put in tubes and or reels or whatever and shipped to the company that makes your cell phone or that makes your car 
or it makes the parts in your car and they put it onto a printed circuit board that could look something like that right there. That's a big ass power supply, big ass TO3 amplifier chips on it. They could put it in something like that and then you buy it and you get to use it and you have no idea that anything like this was ever involved. So when our politicians talk about semiconductor manufacturing, <clears throat> they're only looking at this part, the fab, okay? I guarantee it. And the fab is the, um, it's the <clears throat> grand uh, pillar of the business. And it is the thing that people think about when they talk about making this stuff, even though there's an entire supply chain that is outside the fab and is necessary for it to, to make saleable product. So <clears throat> Intel, when it's gonna spend its $100 billion, is gonna build a factory that takes in bare wafers and puts a pattern on them that comprises the CPU or the i7s, whatever they're making on the surface. And the wafers that Intel are going to make are gonna be a little bit bigger than this one. This is 200 millimeters in diameter. Intel's will be 300. So like 2.25 times the surface area of the wafer that, at that factory because it's a newer factory, whereas these were made in an older facility. So I, I, I sit here and think about $100 billion plus the 20 billions in Arizona, you know, Throw a 10 billion here. Oh, put 3.5 billion to upgrade this one. Oh, 100 billion to build a giant facility in Ohio, which has no native semiconductor industry. Uh, there's a lot of problems there. I just see a lot of problems with this. So if I was, if I owned Intel stock right now, I'd probably be questioning my um, investment choices and possibly looking to sell it because. Um, that is a lot of debt to take on. Um, and I read an article today about this and they were, Intel basically is trying to play catch up. So for the past, I guess it's been 10 years since say the 2009, 2010 timeframe, 2011, Intel has had problems keeping up with companies like TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. And Intel actually has gotten to the point where they've been farming out the manufacturing of their devices to TSMC. <clears throat> and their internal factories have not been able to keep up the state of the art in the business and, um, and, and make the latest generation, the five nanometer or whatever dimension they're on right now, uh, processors, chips, CPUs, devices, um, because of whatever reason, either because of lack of, I don't know if it's lack of investment, I don't know if it's, if it's personnel problems, it sure as hell if it was lack of investment, it's pretty sad because they spend billions and billions and billions of dollars on these places. It's very complicated and the equipment that goes into these factories is 50 million dollars for one machine 100 million dollars for one machine it's absolutely incredible um, basically the machines that produce the they call it lithography the patterns that are on here that are used to then to etch away selective areas of the substrate or of the films that are on this wafer are immensely expensive because they're working in atoms they're working in nanometers, single digit nanometers. It's, the costs are absolutely have ballooned to crazy levels. And <clears throat> I read these articles and, and, and all these companies, Samsung, oh, I even forgot to talk about Samsung's building a $17 billion factory near Austin, Texas. $17 billion. I mean, I know Samsung's a big company, but holy shit, come on. That's expensive. So, the question that I have, 
is we've been making this stuff for decades, at least uh, 50 to 60 years. And the factories in the early days weren't that expensive, even up until the 90s. I mean, a state-of-the-art semiconductor factory in the 1990s might be might have been 200 or 250 or 300 million dollars. Yeah, it's expensive, but it's not a hundred billion. It's a orders of magnitude less. And they were making wafers that were this size, 150 or 200 millimeters. I think I, I think I actually have 150 over here. Let's see. Yes, we do. This is actually integrated circuits that are on this one. Yeah, 150, six inch little guy. So this was probably like 80s vintage, um, state of the art right here. And I look at this device that's on here and I can actually see about how many pins were on that integrated circuit. It may have been, um, it may have been, I'm gonna say two or three dozen at the most. Probably more like two dozen, 24 pin device or a 28 pin device or something like that. And you know, it's not that complex. And that leads me to the next issue in this industry and in this chip apocalypse is um, the automotive business. So the big stink right now is you go to the car dealership if you wanna buy a new, uh, new car or a new truck or whatever you're in the market for and uh, they're like, well, we don't have any in stock right now. You know, we're, we're, we're empty. We don't have anything. Really? You don't have anything? What, how is that possible? You drive by some of the places and you look at their lots and they're definitely a reduced inventory from what we're used to prior to this uh, Chipocalypse pandemic. And... I'm thinking about my car right now, which is a 2011. It's old, it's 10 years old, 11 years old almost, but the electronics that are in it are not particularly complex. So the, probably the most computing power that's in that entire car is in the MP3 player that's in the radio. There's a USB port on the dash where you plug in a USB flash drive and it will load MP3 or whatever audio files off of that and it will play them through the sound system in the car. And the, 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 the processor that takes the MP3 and converts it to sound is probably the most complex computer in the entire vehicle because the car does not have, you know, it, they, they, you don't need a supercomputer in a, in a vehicle, in a car. I don't understand why Intel or Samsung or any of these companies feels the need to spend money, billions and billions and billions of dollars on brand new five nanometer or three nanometer or wherever they're at manufacturing sites to make chips that that, that have about, you know, that run a car, that the engine control module in a car has about as much computing power as a Nokia brick cell phone from 2001. Maybe not even that. Uh, we don't need five nanometer processes to manufacture that stuff. You don't need a hundred billion dollar factory to make the chips that control the battery charger in a Tesla or the, or, or the electric power steering in a Toyota Corolla or the, uh, you know, the automatic headlights in a Ford F-150. You don't need advanced, uh, line, love, you know, single digit nanometer line widths to do all that stuff. It isn't necessary. The chips that are, that are in these things that are in shortage are not complicated devices. So I'm trying to think like, where is, where is the market for all this super, super, super complex, grand, low, you know, small scale uh, manufacturing capacity, what what are they going to make in these facilities? If you're going to build a wafer fab that costs a hundred billion dollars, 
you've got to keep that place at 100% capacity or not you you know the the key to a economics of any factory i don't care if it's semiconductors or if it's anything else is keeping capacity making sure that it's running <clears throat> at almost 100% of what it's designed for otherwise your fixed costs are going to drown out all your profits because these factories it doesn't matter whether you're producing 10,000 wafers per month or if you're producing zero the electric bill the water bill the payroll it's all the same it doesn't change they don't turn they don't shut the place off during holidays they don't shut it off because they're only they don't turn off half the equipment because they're only making half the product it's not how it works so you have to make sure you can keep the line full or the place becomes uneconomic and um, to spend that kind of money on advanced manufacturing when the shortages are for products that are not that don't need that level of, of, of advance of, that don't need that level of, of you know state-of-the-art production Obviously, somebody somebody knows better than I do because somebody is willing to spend a hundred billion dollars on it. But if it was me, and if I had a semiconductor company like Intel, or you know, probably a better not name to choose would be say Texas Instruments or uh, On Semiconductor, On Semi, or uh, you know, Infineon, one of those names, I'd be looking at this like, hey, okay. We can make these wafers that, you know, either 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter with these simple devices on them and use cheaper equipment. You could go to Applied Materials and I'm sure you could buy a etcher or a, 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 a chemical vapor deposition tool or you go to ASML Lithography and you could buy a machine to do lithography with uh, 2005 vintage, uh, you know, line widths, basically the dimensions of the device, say 45 nanometers or something like that, and satisfy the demand for all this, you know, commodity level product that needs that we need for vehicles, electric vehicles for solar inverters, for <clears throat> uh, home appliances, for heat pumps, for all these things. You know, a lot of what the semiconductor shortage is about is simple shit like this. MOSFETs, single transistors that handle a lot of power. Okay? You can make this stuff in a fab with 1990s technology. 1993, 1996, 1999 level of sophistication that goes into making one of these power devices high power electronics so my solar inverters I've got some over here let's see solar inverter this is a cool thing to, to show here so this is an Enphase this is an older one an Enphase M190 micro inverter okay power from the solar panel like this comes in through here DC positive and negative this little black box or gray box has a computer inside of it with a semiconductor chip like I said before the power of a Nokia brick cell phone from 1998 it's inside of here probably your, your Arduino board probably has more power than the processor in this thing because it doesn't need to be that complicated and it's in there and the job of that device is to monitor the power coming from the solar panel and make sure that you're getting the maximum out of it and then it takes it and it puts it through an inverter which consists of devices like this big MOSFET probably not even that big but big you know it's probably like TO220 style things inside of here and it chops up that DC and makes 60 hertz AC and it's and it leaks it out onto this wire and pumps it back into your house so that you can use it. 
and get uh, solar power for your house. These things are made by the millions. And inside of here, I, there's at least, I'm going to say at least six of those MOSFETs, one little low power CPU, and some, some other parts that you need. And, um, and that's it. You don't need a $100 billion factory to make the chips that go into this. Okay? But this is the stuff that we need right now, and we're having shortages because these companies aren't able to produce the, the, the product. And it's going into, I don't know, if it's, I don't know where it's going. Is it going into, where, where are all the chips going? Are they going into, uh, they said that when the pandemic started, everybody started working from home. 30% of the population started working from home. And um, they needed computers and all the different accessories for a home office. And they said that that's where a lot of it was going. I have a feeling that a good amount's going into Bitcoin mining and things like that. But I hope we're not building a $100 billion wafer fab in Ohio to make chips that go to Bitcoin mining. But it's probably going to happen. So that's basically it. The thing with this stuff is, you know, like I said, the complexity, you know, the hundred billion dollars. So like, let's just say other complex things that human beings build, nuclear power plants, you know, here we go. There's a nuclear power plant. That's one that's not far from here. That was built in the, that was built in 1983. I think they said that in few years ago I think in today's dollars if you were to take what they spent on this in today's dollars it's like seven billion dollars which seems pretty reasonable because uh, down in Georgia building a plant nuclear power plant a two-unit system kind of like that called Vogel and it was supposed to cost eight billion dollars eight billion with a B as in Bravo and now, after since 2012, they've been building this thing since 2012. It's run up to like 28 billion dollars, and it's not even running yet. A company went bankrupt over it. Nuclear power plant being built in South Carolina got to like 85 percent completion, and they basically said this is too expensive. We can never finish this, and they just shut it down. So there's a partially completed nuke plant that just got uh, abandoned in South Carolina. Um, and those things only cost $27 billion, whereas this wafer fab is supposed to cost $100 billion. I don't know. I don't know if people are capable of handling individual projects of that magnitude. Now, I will say that a, a, a semiconductor production facility is a little bit different than a nuclear plant because a nuclear plant basically makes one thing. And there's one continuous process of large equipment that is involved in making that one thing, the electricity that it produces. Whereas semiconductors, you have individual machines that each do a unit operation of processing of the uh, wafers in the fab. So each of those machines really just need, they, need, they usually you know, hook them up to power, they need air, they need nitrogen, they need chemicals, they need gases, they need exhaust, and all these utilities that come into the facility to run to, to feed each machine. But all those utilities have to be set up, they have to be working, all of the systems have to be operating for even for just one of the pieces of equipment to work. And then you have to feed the wafers from step to step to step to step all the way through the line, and they go in various orders depending upon the structure of the uh, of the dye that you're making. So you do a patterning, and you do an etching, and you remove material, and then you go back and you strip the resist off, the photo resist as they call it. You send it through chemical vapor deposition or some kind of a process where you put another layer down with a photo mask on top of that, then you etch that. And you know, these simple little transistors like these, like this one, there could be eight, six, seven, eight, nine layers in this thing. And in an Intel 
uh, state of the art CPU, I don't know, it could be 40, 50, 60, I really have no idea because I don't, I'm not around the complex stuff. But it's dozens, absolutely dozens that that wafer has to go through and it could take three, four, five, six months to make a complex wafer like that. I mean, even a simple little wafer like this, it takes like 30 days to manufacture from the time the bare one goes in to the time the finished one comes out and goes packaged up so it can go overseas to Asia and be turned into one of these, or I should say a thousand of these, or however many are on one wafer. And the, you know, the, the, the whole industry is, is so globalized that when, whenever the you know, president gets up and he says, we need chip manufacturing in the U.S., but he's only talking about fabs, he's only talking about one part of a very complex business, okay? You need to make wafers, talking the actual semiconductor uh, substrate. You need the silicon that makes the wafers, or the silicon carbide, or the gallium nitride, or whatever substrate the material is. There's various substrates. You need people to make all that stuff. You need supply chain to supply you with the three dozen chemicals and gases that you need to process this wafer. You need hydrofluoric acid, you need chlorine gas, you need, you know, silane, all these various uh, exotic chemicals. You need a waste treatment system to treat all that. You need to have enough water to run the factory. These factories use hundreds of thousands, even millions of gallons of water every single day. Megawatts of power. You know, one of these Intel fabs is probably using 20, 30 megawatts of electricity. Um, you need to be able to provide that power to the fast facility on a 24-7 uninterruptible basis. So it's, um, it's a major, major thing. Then you need to take those wafers and you need to turn them into finish, finished goods. You know, you need to put it through this process where you have these lead frames that get attached and the die gets stuck on there and it gets soldered in place and, and, the, and the bond of wires to carry the electricity into the dye from the outside world. You need somebody to do that. And we're doing it in Asia. Nothing wrong with that, but whenever somebody from Washington says, oh, we need to do it here in the US, they need to think this in addition to this. And I don't see the connection. I don't see that happening. This is quite labor intensive compared to the fab. The fab uses a lot of engineering type labor. You know, this is a very, technical process. It requires very high level engineering support. This is more hands-on and requires people to do a lot of material handling and package things up and make sure the machines are running right. It's a more traditional factory type environment. Hence the reason the industry has put it in low-wage countries like the Philippines. So that's it. That's my thoughts on a hundred billion dollar factory going into Ohio. I'm all I could say is if it happens, it'll be amazing. But anybody who owns stock in Intel, I'd be careful because that's a lot of money to spend. And let's just hope that they can keep those factories full if they build them. And that's pretty much it.